I'm Casey Quinn, one of the programming directors at the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, and I am so honored to moderate this Q&A for our friends at FLOP. Today, we will dive into the documentary feature Foreign Puzzle with the director, Chitra Dehram, and the main subject and now 10-year cancer survivor of the film, Sharon Merkin. Welcome. Thank so, you very much. Thank you for having us. So Chitra, I'd just like to start off and ask, how did you meet Sharon and what inspired you to make a documentary about her life? Well, um, I was in film school in Austin, Texas, getting an MFA in film production. And at that time I was um, looking for a, um, a story to follow for my thesis project. And about that time, Sharon reached out to our radio, television and films listserv um, with, uh, with the request for someone to document the dance that she was going to make, um, you know, as uh, while she was exploring impermanence, um, you know, when she was getting her cancer treatment, that's sort of how I met Sharon. Um, and the reason I was, I mean, I, initially I was curious and I wanted to help Sharon with, um, with, I think she was going to have a Kickstarter campaign. She wanted the dance documented and initially that was the interest. Um, I also, um, filmmaking is a second career for me. I used to be a physical therapist and at that point um, I was always interested in um, telling stories of, of um, illness um, but not from sort of the medical perspective but from from the perspective of um, you know the person the things that they're thinking about what is going on the things that are invisible that the healthcare community often does not see so that's sort of in, in addition to working on a story that was close to heart um, I was interested in exploring that from my own um, personal interest. And Sharon what was it like to have your life during these like very intimate moments being filmed did you find it particularly difficult to be vulnerable in front of the camera um well it was certainly weird for sure um i you know as a performer i'm used to a camera ca capturing performance perhaps rehearsal video um but when chitra asked me to kind of strap on the microphone while i was at home I was um, perplexed first, like, why does she want to film me while I'm washing the dishes or cooking dinner? Like, why? Um, and I would, you know, run to the restroom and put some lipstick on. <laughs> um, but after um, 18 months of this going on, you know, I got used to it for sure. I didn't run to put lipstick on anymore. Um, and I think that it became it didn't really become easier in a way it became harder because as I grew to trust her um, and we began to dive deeper into what uh, my experience, this, this cancer experience was like, um, you know, when I was, she would ask me very difficult questions with a camera right there. Um, and, you know, at first I, I was scared and thought that I had to come up with incredibly wise words and, you know, illuminate everybody. Um, but, you know, quickly um, that was discarded and it, it really just became part of my journey of introspection and discovery of what all this was. And yes, it was hard because it's not easy to cry in front of someone. It's not easy to cry in front of a camera. Um, it's not easy to know that the camera is capturing you when you look terrible. Um, but also, as time went by, you know, Chitra really became my friend. And she became a companion to me during very lonely and very frightening times. And um, a comfort in a way also. So I would say, um, yes, it was difficult. But there was also something uh, comforting about having someone there with me. Um, documenting this process. So at the time of the film, like we see in Foreign Puzzle that 
you mentioned you had just lost your father to cancer, you went through a divorce, and you had to co-parent your child, Dali, and then you got your cancer diagnosis. What was it like receiving this news while already going through all of these different things, and how did you arrive to dance to help you grapple with your disease? Um, what was it like to receive that phone call is something that only anyone who's ever received that kind of news can understand. Really, no words that I could say can fully encompass what washes over you when you hear those words coming over the phone. Um, and see, it makes me lose my train of thought because I feel like all that emotion, you know, comes back. So what was the second part of the question? The second part was, um, how did you arrive to dance to help you grapple uh, with your disease? Right. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, after the initial shock of the diagnosis, um, I know that there's some people who, you know, right away seek out support groups and go on the internet and find out everything they can about it. I, I was the opposite. Um, I did not want to do research on the internet. I did not want to meet anybody else who was going through this. Perhaps it was a kind of denial. Um, when several months, maybe five months, six months after my diagnosis, when I was in the midst of uh, chemotherapy treatment, was when I went to my very first um, cancer support group with other young women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And I began to talk about what I did, I, you know, I dance and, and all of this. And um, one of them, actually, I have to backtrack. <laughs> um, the idea of doing a dance about this really was unexpected. I did not get diagnosed with cancer and then say, I'm going to make a dance about this. Uh, not at all. Who wants to see a dance about cancer anyway, right? Um, I... Uh, that is when I contacted a friend of mine who appears in the film, Todd, to photograph um, what I was going through. I felt that this would be a way for me to understand and to process. And when I looked at these photographs that Todd had taken of my upper body after surgery, I found that they were incredibly beautiful. They were very poignant. And even though I was horrified by what had happened to my body, I saw a kind of beauty in them. And I thought to myself, they're so beautiful. What, what can we do with these photographs? Can we print them? Can we exhibit them? What can we do? And that's when I thought, okay, this, this, that's his artistic work. He can do, if he wants to have an exhibit, that's what he needs to do or not. But what am I going to do? And that's when the idea of making a dance about what I was going through came to me. And then afterwards came the film because I didn't think right away, oh, I want this to be filmed. But when I went to one of the cancer support groups and I talked about what I was thinking of doing, someone there said, why don't you have someone document the process? And that's when I decided to contact the film department at the University of Texas to see if somebody was interested in documenting the dance making. Little did I know at that time that um, Chicha was going to come on board and want to document a lot more than just what was happening in the dance studio. So Chita, was it difficult for you to capture these movements? How did you go about your filmmaking process? And what challenges did you overcome? Um, I, th I think I, I was pretty naive, like sort of like, you know, kind of how Sharon is talking about what it was, what was what she was expecting in front of camera and what transpired, right? Similarly, um, I thought this was going to be a three months of filming because, you know, when I met Sharon, Sharon was like, Sharon had this tight plan on how, when she was going to rehearse, when she was going to perform, when the show was going to happen. Um, and little did we kind of, you know, so there were two aspects that 
to, was, was challenging to the filmmaking process. Like one is sort of seeing all the, all the stuff that um, Sharon was dealing with in terms of the illness, right? And having the camera present there and making choices on what we want to film, what we don't want to film, and also sort of getting permission to film in all these health institutions. And Sharon was teaching at the school and all, all of that sort of logistics of filmmaking. The third part was capturing the dance, right? Like this was, um, there was there were scenes where um, she was talking to dancers about the making of or what, what was motivating her to make the dance and that was very moving to to even be present in those places and then the second part was how do we capture um, the movement and 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 you know what what I and Therese were experiencing in that space when we were watching the dance right um, how do we sort of translate that into this two-dimensional space and the frame, which folks don't experience that we are experiencing in this three-dimensional space around the dancers, right? So, um, so it was constantly learning uh, when we have to have multiple cameras, when we should step back. There, there are some scenes when it's, the more intimate the scene is, the choice of keeping the camera and me away and keeping the shot wide and not moving in and you know like that sort of learning the language of what we were trying to do um, and when to be intimate when to step away when to turn the camera on when when to um, just be there um, all of that was I, I feel like I grew as a filmmaker in 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 over the 18 months of filming it but I think the hardest part was editing we had nearly 200 hours of footage and you know to pick and to cherry pick the 69 minutes that will make into the film that was the hardest part so your response made me think of two different questions um one is which you kind of touched upon a little bit, what was it like developing such a close relationship with your subject, Sharon, and like picking and choosing those moments to film? And then for Sharon, what was the process like um, trying to choreograph the materiality of impermanence? Like I, the, the scene that you mentioned, Tithra, I was like very touched when Sharon was opening up about her motivation for the choreography. So I'm just wondering what your thought process was behind that. Sharon, do you want to go first for that? Um, no, you go ahead. Almost, um, I forgot what was the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there the, question was, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, the question was, what was it like developing such a close relationship with your subject and like picking and choosing those moments of like what to include, what not to include, and like kind of staying true to your filmmaking process? Sure, yeah, like, uh, for, um, I think I was, um, in terms of the dance, right, it was a 90 minutes dance, there were I think 16, nearly 16 pieces of uh, that kind of made this feature length dance that she was making. And um, we filmed almost all of it, but what we chose to feature in the film were things that had metaphors or parallels to what was going on in her life, right? So um, there was Dali who, uh, and then she was making a duet with Kira, with, um, with Kira um, on um, mother-child relationship, which is sort of like the existential question that everybody that is dealing with cancer kind of goes through, right? What happens to my children, especially with young mothers or young parents, right? Um, so, and that was something that we felt was very universal that people people can take that moment. And, and for, we were also looking for touch points where um, someone who is not, a cancer survivor or a caregiver can relate to that experience because as Sharon was saying, right, these things, um, you know, when, when, when any, when, when the disease comes, it's like this, it, it's like this big, big moment of life altering events. And for people to sort of um, take a moment when they watch this film to sort of empathize with that, right? And so a mother-child relationship or a parent-child relationship, everybody can relate to and what that feels like when you have to make. So that was one big thing that we knew. And then um, there's so much surgery and 
this, I think so one thing that Sharon always felt uh, told us was um, her body no longer felt like hers, like the, the, there were doctors and all these healthcare workers that was sort of, um, you know, she felt um, mutilated and compartmentalized. And so the two dances that were sort of getting to that was what she was doing with the, the, the trio and then the whole, um, and, and, and the entire, the dance that was happening in the cube, right? Feeling trapped, feeling. So we were looking for things in the dance that, that there were metaphors that was happening in, in her medical journey, but also that were going to be touch points that someone who's not affected by cancer, either as a patient or as a caregiver, will really take a moment to sit with that experience, right? And um, yeah, so th those, were, those were where we were. And, um, and of course, um, being cognizant of things that um, Sharon wanted to have us film or not, right? That was definitely, um, you know, we would not do that if, and, um, and then, and then this, uh, you know, Sharon was juggling a whole number, whole bunch of things. And like, there are moments where I'm like, wow, like between teaching full time, between treatments and um, having a very young child, and then having this whole, this huge creative endeavor that she was making where she was teaching and practicing, right? Um, so to, to sort of, initially I wasn't thinking of filming the school, but then I was like, um, I think this was about the time when Obamacare legislation was going on. And I knew this was not a film that was going to be about health access and stuff, but in the background, it, it was necessary to sort of situate that this, you know, Sharon was like, you know, she'll have to leave school at a certain time to go to an appointment and sit forever in these appointments and that she needed the work to kind of have an insurance to have this care, right? So sort of, yeah, so anything that helped people to to understand that even with insurance, this is a very expensive process. So all of those um, all of those things were touch points on decision making on what we were filming or not. Um, you know, it's the first time that I, I think that I've heard you um, explain how it was that you chose the dance scenes that ended up being in the film. Um, and that's interesting for me. Um, as a dancer, as a choreographer, you know, you know, I see the film and I'm like, well, where's that part where I have that great leap? Why didn't she put that in? You know, why didn't she put in that cool part where we're rolling on the floor and whatever? So, you know, so I have other motivations for wanting to see my piece up on, you know, on film. Um, and so I think it's the first time, Chitra, that I've heard you say that. Um, and it, of course, it makes sense that you would choose sequences that had direct metaphors to other scenes that you had chosen um, very specifically for the film. Um, and so, um, Kasia, you asked, how did I choreograph this? Um, you know, choreographers work in lots of different ways. Some choreographers start with an idea, the, some, some choreographers start with the music. Um, at times I've even started with the costume. I once bought a dress and I made a dance for that dress. Um, in this particular instance, um, I knew that I wanted to take the different facets of my life at that time and create vignettes or sequences that I would then arrange into some kind of an order. Um, so as Chitra mentioned, the whole uh, dance performance was actually a 90 minute performance with no intermission and had lots of different sections. Um, and some of the sections that come to mind right now um, were, of course, the sequences with the young girl um, who was 11 at the time. She graduated from college recently, incredibly. Um, but of course, are directly related to the thoughts that were going on in my head um, about my son and about other young women. Um, there were sequences about, you know, kind of body mutilation, which is something that I felt very. Um, 
intensely. There were sequences of uh, lightness also. So the sequences where we're playing with the bras really come from uh, my visits to Target, looking at the bras that they sell there and, and the multicolored bras that they have with polka dots and purple and green, and just wanting to do something with those bras because the significance of that article of clothing um, was magnified for me. It was something that I'd never really paid attention to before. I didn't even like bras before. But I still don't like them. <laughs> um, some other parts uh, were uh, based on what I felt from friends who rallied around me to support and their fear and worry and their impotence, wanting to help, but not really having a way um, to do that. Um, there was a sequence that um, was with other cancer survivors. So kind of the sisterhood that, um, that grew with other women who were going through the same thing. Um, so all of these little vignettes come from different ideas and different images and feelings that I had during the entire journey. Well, pivoting a little bit, you both mentioned the film featuring like your parent-child relationship with you, Sharon, and your son, Dali. So what was it like filming with your son? And for Chitra, what was it like working with a young child and including him in this piece? Do you want to go ahead, Chitra? <laughs> sure. Dali is a young man now. I mean, I, I, I wonder what Dali would be thinking about this. Um, at, that, at that point, he was, he was like, you know, he, he would not sit still. Like he, he was a, he was, um, was very, very excited about a lot of different things. And um, I think, you know, um, I, I think anytime I filmed him, it would be 10 minutes, 15 minutes here and there over time. Um, very curious little child. And I, I think I filmed this whole scene with him getting um, Louis, is a kitten and I, I fought for that scene till the very last cut of the film and it didn't make it into the film <laughs> um, both you know uh, yeah so with him it was it was really sort of playful being playful you know letting him talk about things and I think I, I don't think when he was I don't think Sharon used the word cancer with him at all so kind of having anything to film you know, talking about things, but not calling it anything and sort of, um, and I, I also think um, he also had these very, like he would, I think there was a time, I don't, I don't remember exactly when Sharon and within the 18 months is, I think he start, he got a handle of the concept of death and he would talk about it in all these other, uh, other ways. And so he was also in that age group where he was trying to understand what that was. Um, and he had two gerbils and he was learning to um, give them instructions and having them respond to instructions. So there's a lot of these little <laughs> things that Dali was doing that, um, it was, it, yeah, we were um, getting to film sometimes in play mode sometimes. And I think, I think there was, there's a scene where um, Sharon tries to take the, any, you know, Sharon tries to take, take naps and his concept of time was very, you know, it's very, he didn't have a sense of how long an hour or 30 minutes was at that time. So it was, it was getting, I, th I think with, with Dali, we were, I guess what I was trying to do was to get a sense of how in his own world he is and how that is also sort of like this big, like what, what do, what does Sharon or any parent choose to share, choose not to share. And there's no one way to go about it. And we just, I, I just wanted it to be there. So people watching it, think about it and reflect on it, whatever those choices are in their, in their life. So that was sort of the, um, yeah, in, intention or interest with, with filming Dali. Well, in, in terms of um, myself as a mother, I, I don't think if I hadn't trusted Chitra that I would have permitted someone to be filming him. Um, so as a filmmaker, I know that that's just something that's really essential is to establish that trust with whoever it is that you're filming. Um, and my son um, really liked Chitra too. So I think there was a very human, relationship, friendship 
um, that developed um, between the three of us. Um, I don't remember if I used the word cancer or not. It, I, I think I, I don't know that I wouldn't have, um, but I probably didn't harp on it. Um, it was important for me to be honest, but I also did not want to communicate fear to him. So I was honest about what was going on, but I did not say I'm scared of dying. Of course, you don't say that to a five year to your five year old child. Um, and, you know, there are some scenes that I see in the film, like when we're playing with these kind of uh, foam bats at each other and he gets hurt. I remember that I think that most of the reason why he was crying was because he was embarrassed that this had happened in front of Chitra and in front of the camera probably more in front of Chitra. I don't think the camera had a lot of effect on him, but just the fact that there was someone else who watched him get hurt, um, you know, made him very upset. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, there was some uh, self-consciousness um, on his part, you know, some of the time at least. Um, but, you know, now that he is a young man, he just turned 17 a few days ago. He has not seen this film. And I don't want him to see it at this time. At some point, you know, when he is an adult, if he asks me to see it, I will certainly, you know, pass it on to him. But um, even now, when I, if I see the film and I think, should I show this to Dali? Should I ask him to watch it? I watch it and it's too painful for me. And it would be for me painful for him to see that pain. Um, you know, I'm still his mom, I'm his protector, and I still even, you know, at age 17, don't want him um, to, to have that, that in his heart. Someday he'll watch it, but um, not yet. <laughs> so that kind of leads into my last question for you, Sharon. It's been about 10 years now since the events of the film, and how do you feel like revisiting these moments and watching like the early stages of your diagnosis and going through all that you've been through. Yeah, it seems like yesterday when I see it, it really does. Um, and I can bring up if I choose to all of those emotions all over again. Um, but 10 years have passed and um, there has been much growth um, and uh, opportunities for reflection and for processing and for understanding um, everything that took place. And I'm in a good place in my life right now. Um, I am healthy so far, right? Because um, what cancer uh, patients know is that um, you're never really cured, um, at least for breast cancer, you might consider yourself in remission um, it's something that can always come back. And that is a constant reminder that I need to enjoy what I have now and enjoy those around me, enjoy my family. And I am in a good place. I feel healed. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't remember and that I don't feel, but I am healed and in a, in a place that is peaceful and joyful. Thank you so much for those lovely words. Um, and thank you for joining us today to discuss this film. It was lovely talking to you both. And thank you to the audience for listening. Be mm -hmm. sure to check out other films and flops lineup this year. Thank you so much for sharing our work and thank you for taking time to ask us questions. Yeah, muchas gracias. <laughs>